Okay, then I would um, start. So um, thank you for your attendance. Um, my name is Tobias Tefke. I'm studying computer science at Schmalkalden University at Applied Sciences and I'm about to finish my bachelor um, by this semester and then I will start with my master's and um, Professor Ralf Staudemeyer can't be here today. Um, he is a professor at Schmalkalden University of Applied Sciences um, for IT security, um, especially IT security on constrained devices like microcontrollers. And um, at our university we have a course on mobile security. Um, and for this course, we have um, some microcontrollers, the students should program. And these microcontrollers are located in a laboratory. And during the corona pandemic, um, there was no access possible to the laboratory for students. So um, in order to make it possible that students can actually take part in this course, we had to find a solution on how students can work with these uh, microcontrollers remotely. And in order to make this possible, we decided to create a virtual laboratory which resembles the physical laboratory we have at our university. And um, But everything should be available online and also all the time for students without any restrictions. And for that, we um, decided on building a virtual laboratory for the university, which is called the Suasec Lab Virtual Laboratory. And I would also like to present that laboratory to you now. So um, as, just as a quick outline, first I will talk about the main problems we faced um, and what led to the development of the laboratory. Then I will um, talk shortly about Work Adventure, which we are using as underlying platform for our laboratory. So we basically take Work Adventure and extend it. And in um, section two, I will um, talk about Work Adventure itself. And then in section three, I will talk about what we um, did in order to build our own laboratory. Um, however, we um, had um, two um, major um, issues and when um, we implemented that laboratory. Um, first of all, we um, actually had to use a part of Work Adventure which um, is proprietary and of course um, we don't want any proprietary bits in our laboratory. Therefore, we decided on re-implementing the administration service and in section 4 I will talk about how we did that and in um, section 5 I will talk about um, some security issues we found in Work Adventure um, when building our laboratory and there I will talk about um, how we found, found these um, issues and also about how these issues can be mitigated. And in the end, I will talk a bit about the transferability of our work. So that, for example, if you're interested in building your own laboratory, that you have some starting points. And we um, also publish all our source code so that you can just take it from GitHub and build your own laboratory on top of ours or use our code or parts of them. So um, first of all, the main problem we had are that um, these um, IoT devices, um, we have um, Solertia remotes, which are microcontrollers um, running the Contiki operating system. Um, they were developed as part of a research project on um, confidentiality and integrity in constrained environments. And um, But basically, um, that's not the point. Um, basically, you could uh, you could use any microcontroller for our laboratory, so you could also think about um, using Arduinos or similar platforms. And as already said, um, our university has a course in which um, these programs, uh, these remotes, should be programmed in C. And um, as we weren't able to hand out these devices to students, we had to find a solution on how students can work with them from home during the time of the corona pandemic. Um, so therefore, we decided on building a virtual platform. However, we also wanted a couple of other features. So for example, um, Big Blue Button is a pretty, f f um, pretty known platform for online lectures. However, um, 
Big Blue Button also has some limitations. So for those people who don't know, um, Big Blue Button it's basically some online conferencing soft software which was especially designed for lectures. So for example, the presenter can upload um, some slides in PDF format, and then um, the participants can download these slides, or the slides are being shown in the browser, and that saves a lot of network traffic because the slides only have to be downloaded once, and you don't have to share your screen all the time. However, um, what um, we found as limitation in Big Blue Button was that um, even though um, it resembles a lot like a lecture, it basically isn't a lecture because in a lecture um, you also um, talk to your seat neighbors and maybe make some jokes or talk about the topic of the lecture and that's not possible in Big Blue Button. So we wanted to have some kind of option where you are able to talk with your seat neighbors and also without the professor or instructor noticing it. And um, the third problem we also um, had are, is um, privacy. So um, for those um, who um, had to deal with conferencing systems during the corona pandemic, um, know that um, there are many, many tools you could use. But um, when it comes to open source software or software which um, is privacy friendly, then um, you'll soon notice that um, many of the conferencing systems which are available are basically um, harvesting user data or maybe even selling it. Um, so we wanted to have a privacy-oriented um, um, system and we only wanted to store as little information as necessary to operate the service. So um, when designing this presentation, I was pretty unsure what I should put on the slide and what you can actually see here is not the problem, but our solution to it. So basically, um, when setting up a user for a, for a system in which he should be able to work, then um, the problem we would have is that we have a lot of students and generating accounts for every student um, wouldn't really make sense because um, each um, account would have the same rights and therefore we decided on creating one account for each user group. So basically all students which are working in the laboratory log in using the same account. So um, basically what you need to store in the database are these couple of keys um, which are being displayed here. So the underscore ID basically comes from the um, NoSQL database we're using. Um, the identifier in Work Adventure is a UUID, um, which we have to store, of course, um, and it's also used for um, generating the invitation link. Um, the name key is a bit um, confusing because what's actually um, being stored there is something like a description of the account. So that's not the name which you will have in Work Adventure itself. When you log in, you will have the option to um, select your own name regardless of what is stored in the database. So, for example, for the student account, um, the name just is being set to student so that we know that uh, that is a student account. Um, the email is um, also only used as identifier, so we just um, use UUID at the domain where all laboratory runs. And um, some other things like the visit card URL or messages you could send to users are basically just things we don't use. And the text, that's basically just an array of strings which is being used to determine access rights to um, the maps of our world. So um, now let me um, shortly introduce you to Work Adventure, which we use as underlying platform for our laboratory. So for those who um, maybe took part in the last um, meetings of the CCC maybe no work adventure because it was used there um, but for those who didn't take part there I'll um, shortly introduce you into work adventure now. So basically work adventure is um, a conferencing system in the style of a 2D game. So basically um, each user has an avatar which you can move over the map and whenever um, you move around that map um, which really resembles a real world. You can um, use several features in there. So um, the main feature, of course, is communicating. And basically, um, Work Adventure um, features a 
group communication which works just in the same way as in real life so another multiple people move their characters close to each other um, then um, a communication channel is being established between them and they can talk directly to each other and when you decide to leave the group um, then you also won't participate in that um, talk anymore and um, what um, really is important to mention here is that um, the um, communication um, usually happens um, decentrally so um, when multiple users stand nearby um, decentral communication channels are being established between them so um, that the server on which work adventure is running doesn't um, get any information about the meeting um, so um, sometimes it may fail that um, a decentral meeting can be set up then um, the server has to interact with that but um, usually um, the meetings are decentral so um, after the meeting ended no one can actually say that a meeting took place and um, another really um, important feature are so-called actions so um, if i go one slide back you can see that there are multiple actions uh, multiple um, not mul multiple actions but multiple areas in the map and on areas you can put actions so actions are basically um, things which happen after you confirm them so here it says um, press space or touch here to enter the Jitsi meeting room um, I know it's not really readable but um, what actually would happen here is that once you um, click um, on that message or hit the space button then um, every um, then you would um, take part in the Jitsi meeting which um, was defined as um, part of this map area and once multiple users are on the same area and um, open the Jitsi room they can also have a bigger conference and what um, really is important to mention here is that um, opening Jitsi rooms um, is just one action so um, it's also possible to um, use other actions like embedding websites and iframes and basically that's what we're mainly using for our laboratory so um, basically um, work adventure has a scripting api and um, also um, some kinds of event handling so in work adventure when um, you go to a part of a map or an area um, this can be detected and using the scripting API you can subscribe to events which are being generated when you for example um, walk on a specific area and then you can um, respond to that event so for example um, here we have a group workplace and whenever someone comes close to these tables then it's being shown what um, which microcontroller is available on the table and also which sensors are connected and here it would also be possible to hit space and then you can um, work directly with that microcontroller and how this exactly works um, I will present it in the next section but um, so far I just would like to ask you if everything is clear now or are there any questions um, so far okay fine so um, then I will just um, talk a little bit about what we did in order to build our own laboratory so um, of course I already talked about a big bit big blue button and we decided to um, integrate big blue button into our work adventure system um, here i have to say that in the latest version of work adventure big blue button is also integrated but um, when we started development about a year ago um, big blue button wasn't available in work adventure and also the current implementation does not um, really feature what we would like to have because um, in work adventure when you um, use their default implementation of big blue button you um, can um, join the room but then you are being disconnected from um, any group communications so basically um, the whole area um, where big blue button is um, is defined is not um, available for group meetings and of course that is not what we wanted to have so basically for setting up big blue button we um, defined the lecture room as an area 
And then we listen using the scripting API, we listen whenever the user is um, walking onto that area. And then we um, just show a message to the user um, if he wants to join the lecture. And if the user confirms, um, then we send a request to an extent to a service we um, implemented, which um, basically um, checks whether the user is allowed to um, use the service. And if that's true, then we generate the link to the big blue button room and send it back to the user. And then the user's client can um, open an iframe containing big blue button. And um, while the user then joins the conference, um, he is still able to communicate with other users um, in the lecture room. So basically what we have here is um, some kind of a lecture which um, really resembles a real world one because you can talk with your sweet neighbors. Um, when it comes to working on virtual machines, um, the task um, to realize that was a bit harder because um, we um, had um, a server on which we um, created virtual machines. However, um, the question is how to access a virtual machine from the web. And that turned out to be not as straightforward as we first thought. But um, we um, found a solution to it and that basically works the following way. Um, I don't know if you are all familiar with the VNC protocol, but um, for those who don't know it, VNC is basically a protocol which makes it possible to, remo uh, to remotely control a computer. And um, what we um, had on our server was um, a hypervisor. We used Quick Emulator, uh, yeah, Quick Emulator with KVM, and luckily that hypervisor already um, features. A VNC server for all the virtual machines, which um, can be enabled easily. And then what you basically get is a TCP port on which you can um, connect with a VNC client. And um, usually these VNC clients are native applications, but as Work Adventure is a web application, we also wanted to be the client a web application. So we looked for um, VNC web clients, and there is one. It's called NoVNC. Um, it's basically a VNC client ri written in JavaScript. So um, in theory, using NoVNC, we could um, connect to that um, virtual machine. However, the problem still is that um, using JavaScript, you cannot um, connect to the TCP um, socket, which is opened by Quick Emulator. So you need some kind of um, translation, which makes it possible for the JavaScript client to um, communicate with that port. And for that, there is a program called WebSockify, which basically uh, translates a TCP socket to a WebSocket. And luckily, JavaScript can access WebSockets. So NoVNC basically um, also features a second program called WebSockify. And WebSockify does all the translation between WebSockets and TCP sockets. And then you can actually pretty easy um, access the virtual machine. However, um, the problem we um, quickly faced is that um, the original implementation of WebSockify doesn't really scale well. So um, first of all, um, WebSockify as a main implementation is um, written in Python. And um, secondly, it um, only can translate one port of uh, one TCP port to a WebSocket. So if we have a virtual PC pool with um, 30 virtual machines, we would have to uh, um, have 30 instances of WebSockify running, which we didn't want. But um, luckily, there are some ports of WebSockify to um, faster languages. And we found a port which, um, and which um, WebSockify was ported to Go. Um, that port contains some bugs, but we were able to fix them really quickly. And we also made a small addition on that, um, so that basically WebSockify can read all the TCP ports and WebSocket um, translations from a configuration file, and then basically it um, opens channels for each um, 
support that should be translated and using that um, we were able to um, have um, a really quick translation between TCP and WebSockets and um, turned out that using that way um, accessing the virtual machine basically um, feels like if you would work with the computer directly. Um, However, um, so far we only had a virtual machine in which you can run programs. So here, what you can see is the Contiki simulator, which um, a Koja simulator, which simulates uh, microcontrollers running the Contiki system. So basically, you can um, do some pretty basic steps in programming microcontrollers. But um, when it comes to larger projects, um, of course, it is necessary to work on real hardware. And um, here we made um, the decision to set up um, computers in our laboratory and connect the remotes to them. And uh, the remotes are basically just another um, name of the microcontrollers we have. So um, the Solartia remotes are being connected to the hypervisor of the virtual machines and then being passed directly using USB pass through to the virtual machine. And we also um, did the same with the webcam, which films the microcontroller all the time. So that, for example, when you do some exercises like um, blinking LEDs or something like that, you can directly see that um, from home. Um, what was still missing was the um, feature to communicate in groups. Um, Actually, you could use the group communication feature of Work Adventure, but the problem is that um, the radius for the group communication is not so big that you could use it for um, communicating at these desks. And furthermore, if someone would just walk um, near the table and someone is sitting there, they would be um, um, both put in a group and probably not everyone walking by um, wants to... Um, join the group. So we decided to declare the zones near the tables as silent zones where the group communication is disabled and instead put all users working on a remote into a separate Jitsi room. And basically what happens is that we have um, developed a really small software called multi-user virtual machine assigner which ensures that all um, people who are working on a virtual machine are also in a Jitsi room and can talk with each other. And um, here you can also see the same um, effect on the um, on a real remote in the um, slide before here um, you can see another room which is a general purpose PC pool we also developed and using that PC pool um, you can learn a lot of programming languages. We set up um, many program languages in that um, virtual machine for the general purpose PC pool. So for example, you can learn um, Java programming or also web programming using PHP, but um, there are also tutorials on operating systems and so on. So um, here a lot of um, lecturers from, from our um, faculty gave us some um, material we could put into the virtual machines and then the students can work with the materials on their own. So um, yeah, here you can also see the same with a remote and um, here I also have a small um, video which I would like to show to you. So um, basically um, I'll show in this video how you work with the remote. So first you walk to the place and then you um, well, that was maybe a little bit quick, but um, first you walk to the place and then a pop-up is being shown in which you can see um, what um, remote um, or what microcontrollers are available and also which sensors are connected to them. And then, of course, also no VNC opens and then you can just um, put no VNC in full screen. And there you can um, directly work with the remote. So first of all, we're letting show um, the remote in the console and then um, we um, enter some make commands in order to um, compile a really small um, program which um, basically lets some LED blink and now we upload the program to the remote and now you should um, soon see um, a blinking LED in the um, top right corner of the remote. Yeah, so now it blinks. 
And basically what you can see here is that you're directly able to interact with the remote and you can um, program, it, program it in real time and um, basically um, use, uh, there are some other commands available like um, accessing the shell of the um, of the um, remote and so on. So basically um, just all features which are um, available using the tool chain and as already said in the introduction um, it's basically possible to connect any USB device to the virtual machine so um, if you have other controllers or hardware you would like to program you could also use the solution and just um, pass um, the USB device to the virtual machine. Um, here I also um, brought you a little photo which um, shows um, how the remotes were basically placed in our laboratory. So we have um, a table and on the table um, basically um, six remotes are placed for the six um, group workplaces we have. And um, basically um, for each remote there's also a webcam with, um, that captures um, the um, video stream of the remotes. Um, as you um, maybe saw earlier in the screenshot of the laboratory, um, we have more than six places, um, but um, we decided to make six places on which groups can work on remotes and on the other um, places a um, single user can work with the emulator. So um, the students who just want to get a little bit in touch um, with how everything works, they can, for example, use the emulator and the students who work on bigger um, problems uh, projects they can use um, the physical remotes. So um, just to show you how everything um, works together, I um, have um, created that um, figure which um, basically shows the main parts of our laboratory. So of course there is Work Adventure which has a front end which is basically the client you run in your browser and then the back end which are um, services we um, offer on our server. And Work Adventure on its own also Im already embeds Jitsi, which you can use. And since a couple of um, months, I think also Big Blue Button, but here we decided to use our own implementation. So um, basically, um, we have two options on how to integrate Big Blue Button. And um, in order to make it possible to work with um, the remotes, we um, also integrated no VNC into the work adventure front end. And um, in order to being able to communicate with the virtual machine itself, um, we use the um, VNC server of this virtual machine provided by the hypervisor and translates the TCP um, socket to a WebSocket using WebSocket 5. And for um, multi-user workplaces, um, we have developed a multi-user virtual machine assigner which um, embeds no VNC and Jitsi meet and that way it's ensured that the people who work on a multi-user workplace can also communicate with each other. Um, for being able to create big blue button rooms, we um, also have to call the big blue button API from the work adventure backend. Um, but basically that are only some API calls. Um, I think in our implementation um, the whole um, creation of the big blue button room is maybe about 50 lines of code so um, it's actually pretty straightforward and the big blue button API is also um, documented very well. But um, still we had one large problem and that um, is that some features Work Adventure offers are only available in the paid version. So there's an open source version which contains the most important parts of Work Adventure but there's also a paid version which um, you can use for features like access restriction to the map because if you don't use any access restriction basically everyone who has a browser can visit the laboratory and do stuff there and we didn't want that but we also didn't want to pay um, for a proprietary software um, and of course in order to preserve the user's privacy we also wanted to have all the data in our data center so um, we definitely didn't want to integrate um, the administration service from work adventure itself 
as though we decided to re-implement it. Um, and on that I would like to talk now, but so far I would also like to ask you if there are any questions so far. Uh, yes? Or I think you need a microphone. Oh, yes, that's also... Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the question was, um, how do we deal with uh, microcontroller failures, um, for example, if the microcontroller um, stops working or has to be reset? So um, that's a really good question, and that was a problem we faced, and um, for the, um, some problems we don't have a kind of a real solution, but... Um, Usually, um, resetting them is, in our case, likely possible using a command we can issue over USB, so we can do it from the virtual machine. And um, if the um, microcontroller um, becomes stuck, it may um, not be available via USB, but um, we found out that it luckily resets when rebooting the hypervisor. So what we actually have is that we have... Um, one desktop computer for each remote, and if a remote fails, then we just reboot the hypervisor, and then after the reboot, the remote is available again. So um, it's maybe not a perfect solution, but one which works and also works without anyone having to go to our physical laboratory and reset it manually. Okay, so I hope this um, answers your question. Um, the micro um, um, controller itself, um, when being connected to the hypervisor, um, basically we have installed the program which or the toolchain which you use for programming on the hypervisor too. And there we have um, for our microcontrollers there is a toolchain which makes it possible to communicate directly with the um, controller. So um, in case anything fails there, we can always um, issue commands via USB. And if that fails, then we can just reboot the um, hypervisor. So I, I hope this answers your question. OK, so um, for the details, we can also talk about um, that after the presentation. OK, so I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, otherwise, I would. Um, continue with the re-implementation of the proprietary admin services. So um, basically, when showing you the um, architecture of the laboratory, I was a bit simplifying on how Work Adventure works. <laughs> so um, Work Adventure um, has the front end, of course, which is the client running in your browser, but the back end actually isn't one service, but um, there are many services which interact with each other. So. Um, when connecting to Work Adventure, you basically connect to the pusher service. And the pusher service can either answer a request on its own or forward the request to another service, um, which can be the back service, um, which is um, yeah part of the back end. But actually, the pusher also um, acts like a back end. So um, it's not um, very clear to make um, uh, to say what actually is um, the big difference. Um, the documentation says that the pusher um, handles all incoming connection and forwards them, but um, when you take a closer look at the code, then um, what I have to say is that it rather looks like the code um, evolved by the time and um, you can't really make a very clear distinction, but um, Maybe there are also people having other um, opinions on that. So um, of, uh, someone um, wants to share that. Um, I'm also very happy. But um, the main distinction basically we have to make is um, that the pusher and back um, service can work with or without the administration service. So um, 
if you don't use um, the proprietary administration service or our re-implementation, then um, the pusher and back can notice that and um, uh, just um, give you an error um, when a function which actually would require a working admin service, um, then you would just get an error. I can um, show it to you in one slide. Um, so um, how did we actually found out how um, the communication to the admin service works? So um, as pusher and back have to talk to the admin, you also can find um, the structure of the API endpoints in the code because, um, of course, pusher and back have to know um, where the um, admin service resides and also um, how to interact with it. So um, the API endpoint structure was already um, defined in the code more or less um, since a couple of weeks. Um, it's also documented using AP open API. So um, building your own administration service um, is a little bit more easier now. Um, it wasn't documented when we started our development, but um, you could actually see um, pretty fast that um, the communication with the admin service only happens using HTTP requests, which are being um, sent to the administration service, and then the administration service um, responses with um, a JSON encoded object. So um, here I also um, brought a small code snippet from the um, get URL rooms from same world function. So um, basically that function is being used when an administrator tries to broadcast a global message to all users over all maps of the world. And what you can see here is that if um, no admin API URL is defined, which actually just means that no um, admin service is available, then um, you get back an error. And in case um, you have an admin API, then a request is being sent to it using Axios. And if you get a result, then the um, data of the request is being returned to the client. Or, well, in this case, the client is the backend, but the backend then um, acts um, basically as, um, well, the backend um, then um, works a bit different. Um, um, yeah, how to <laughs> say it's the easiest way. Um, the backend, when um, receiving the answer from the um, administration service, evaluates it and then handles according to the um, result um, or it um, deals with the error it got because no um, admin API is present. And um, there we, um, in the files I mentioned, you can find all the other um, admin API endpoints. So um, when you defining our admin services, we just um, provide um, these API um, ru uh, rules, uh, routes and um, our administration service then has to interpret um, the data which was sent by the backend and can then act according to it. So in that case, um, the get all um, maps function basically um, hands over a parameter from the current rooms URL, but actually even if the, this parameter is handed over, um, I didn't really find figured out how that um, data is used um, from what I assume is that basically this um, parameter is not even used. At least um, our administration services works without that parameter for over half a year now. So um, what we do is um, fetching all maps from the database and generating all links of the world um, using a for each um, loop and then we just um, return a JSON encoded array of um, all um, rooms we have and basically then the function in the backend just um, returns this data back to the um, back or pusher um, service whichever um, calls the API. 
So um, our administration service basically works um, that way that we set up a PHP script for each request. Um, so um, each um, request um, has a corresponding PHP script which is being called when um, the back or pusher component calls um, the corresponding API endpoint. Um, in order to um, re-implement our administration service, we had to look up how the fetch data is being used because um, no um, documentation was available, but um, even though it wor worked very well to figure out how everything works, and now there's even documentation available, so um, if you would like to build uh, an administration service now, you could um, use the open API definition and um, for example, use um, Swagger for um, generating the API endpoints. Um, even though we don't want to st store any user information, we at least have to store the information about the account. And there we use a NoSQL database. Um, but of course, we um, try or we also um, only store um, just a little bit of information, so we don't have to store any um, information which um, could be used to figure out which person is used the server as a service. And Work Adventure also only um, stores IP addresses and so on temporarily. So as soon as the user leaves the laboratory, um, basically the information about him is gone. Um, well. Then um, we still had the problem that um, if you have a database and you want to get data from it, that's one thing. But um, the question also is how do you put data into the database? And um, of course, you could use it um, using the command line. But um, this um, would be a pretty tedious task if you have a larger number of um, users or user groups. So we decided to um, build a small web interface for that. Um, so that it is easily possible to um, input and modify data. And that was also the reason why we use um, PHP for um, the, for answering the um, HTTP requests um, sent from backend pusher, because um, in PHP we were able to um, just um, um, define all the database functions we need, and then we can reuse um, database functions we use for our web interface. Um, we can reuse it for the scripts answering the HTTP requests, so that we just save some kind of work here. And yeah, that's just a little um, screenshot of our administration web interface. So basically, in the administration panel, you can um, you can um, change the settings of all the rooms or maps we have. And you can also do some kind of user management, like, um, for example, which user is allowed to um, access which maps. And um, concerning textures, um, you um, can also um, add textures um, using the administration service. So um, if you have um, like an own avatar which you would like to use, you can just add it using the administration panel and then use it in Work Adventure. So yeah, that was the last slide on how we re-implemented the administration panel. So um, if there are any questions left, um, you can ask them now or later. So I don't know if there are any questions regarding that. Um, this doesn't seem to be the case, then I will shortly talk about the um, security-related issues we found. So basically, um, since many services of Work Adventure um, communicate using HTTP requests, we um, just tested a little bit out um, what happens, for example, if you send crafted HTTP requests to um, services, and for that we used an HTTP client. Um, my choice was curl, but um, of course you could also use other clients. And um, so basically um, an attack vector we found was that um, using crafted requests you can basically um, interact with um, many access points because there is um, little um, access protection. And we also found out that the uh, um, default administration token, which is being present in the community version, can be um, misused for 
um, acquiring debug information, which um, maybe should be uh, available for admins, but definitely not for everyone. So, um, yeah, we drafted some HTTP requests, and with them we were able, for example, to um, show a warning that the room is almost full. And we also um, received different kinds of debug messages, and we even found one denial of service error, which um, happened during processing a craft API request. Um, yeah, the solutions to them are, of course, um, do not um, use any default values. And even if you um, set up work adventure or a software on that own, don't use um, the default value, which is um, um, present in the source code. Um, if you find something like that, um, you should um, change it, but better um, change the code so that um, no something like default or admin um, uh, passwords are hard coded in code because um, sooner or later someone is going to figure that out and misusing it. Yeah, so um, concerning access um, restrictions, of course, it has to be checked if a user is allowed to use the API route. So um, a little bit of authentication there um, is um, a good solution and also validate the input of the user. So um, we had um, for the denial of service error, we had um, a problem that um, it was detected that um, the user is not an admin and um, even the input was um, validated there, but um, the error which was then thrown wasn't handled correctly and this error basically caused um, the failure of the application itself. So um, it should also be mentioned that errors should be handled properly and um, in some other um, uh, uh, um, API requests we also found that um, input validation is missing and um, with some um, specific input you can also cause some errors. So just um, let me show um, the code of the, um, or the code, um, how to um, receive the debug information. Um, all um, the issues I um, presented um, basically um, use some crafted um, HTTP requests, so I won't show um, every request on separate slides because they all work very similar. But um, you were able to um, receive um, debug information in Work Adventure by calling um, the dump route on Pusher and then handing over the default token, um, default administration token, and in every community instance, um, then Work Adventure um, replied with debug information about the users. Um, I cut it out there, but um, you can see in the content length that um, a lot of information um, was sent back to the um, client sending the request and in that um, content which was sent back you could for example find as all the IP addresses of the connected users. Um, of course we um, reported that bug and it's also been fixed for quite a while now. But um, yeah, there were many um, HTTP routes which you could pretty easily abuse. And um, I also um, um, I'm unsure whether um, all um, <laughs> all um, routes are secured now. I hope so. But um, as uh, when I did um, this, uh, when I found it, um, it was some month, some kind of month ago. And I hope that they. Um, um, introduced um, the, um, the verification of users n everywhere and not um, only at the points which I found out and reported because um, a fellow student of mine um, did the same analysis um, a couple of weeks later and he found some um, routes which um, was, um, were not um, secured, but um, were secured when I did this. So um, I hope that current um, versions are well um, hardened. But um, I also saw that um, there were some um, commits concerning that. So I hope that everything is um, fixed and they have learned from that issue. 
um, here in the screenshot, um, you can basically see um, this full room warning, which I mentioned earlier. So basically, um, when a um, number of users has been connected to work adventure and um, the server has um, the feeling that um, maybe um, <laughs> the CPU is running um, or is, um, yeah, running on its limits, then you can say um, that no more people should be allowed to enter the laboratory and then you can show this rooming, uh, this warning, but um, the um, problem here is that um, when um, I tested this route, um, everyone was able to show that warning by just calling the route and um, um, yeah, so um, basically this um, shouldn't work for everyone and um, of course we also reported that issue and it has also been fixed now. Um, yeah, so I don't know if there are any questions regarding this analysis. Um, if not, I would continue with the transferability and of course you also have the options to, as an option to ask questions in the end of um, the presentation. So basically, um, our solution inherits all features from Work Adventure. So it's fully um, also um, fully um, uh, cooperable with Work Adventure. And what we did um, is extending these features by using the scripting API. So um, basically, um, all features we added. Um, now happen in separate services, so um, we can develop them independently from Work Adventure. So um, whenever a new version is being released, we um, can pretty easily upgrade because um, we don't have to do any changes in Work Adventure. So we more or less go with the um, vanilla Work Adventure from upstream and just um, put everything we added into scripts which are being loaded along the map. Um, and um, yeah, this functionality, um, of course, um, um, we added um, the functionality to work on in virtual machines and group, and also um, we added big blue button. And in the end, we also re-implemented the proprietary admin service. Um, uh, but um, still, um, there are as you can basically include any web application. You can add a lot of extensions to Work Adventure um, if you want. So um, just feel free to add your own extensions. And um, if you're interested in how that is being done, you can have a look at our GitHub um, repository. So um, just go to githubcom lab and you can find out about all the services we added and I can also tell you now that the services we added um, I only talked about some of them so you can find out about more services on github and we also wrote a small article about the laboratory which you can find under the following um, link and in case you have any questions you can just um, contact me or professor Staudemeyer via email and um, yeah so that's basically the presentation and I would also like to thank um, my fellow students who helped me um, with this talk for example for taking um, the pictures I showed to you earlier and there were also some fellow students who developed some other features um, for our laboratories or for example there's a relaxation area in which you can play games like Pac-Man and some students also developed um, own games which we include so I would also um, thank them for their contributions. And yeah, so um, if you have any questions now, please let me know and we, I will try to answer them. Yeah. Okay, so um, for the maps, um, there's basically a map editor. So um, Burke Adventure uses the tiled map editor, which is used by a couple of 2D games. And um, just um, creating a map by saying um, there's a table, there's um, some lobby and so on, that basically goes pretty quick because um, it's basically um, uh, what you see is what you get editor. Um, it becomes a little bit more difficult when um, adding own services, um, then you have to write a script and basically what we do is that um, the JavaScript um, be add 
subscribes to events happening on the map. And when you, for example, detect that the user enters a specific area, then we um, respond to that. And usually um, what we do is that we include a website which contains the requested service. And for that, um, we have usually to cr create a link, um, for example, to handle over JORT tokens, which we use for authentication. And what you, we basically do is that um, we um, create an XHR request to um, the service, um, or uh, basically it's more or less um, a middleware which um, does all the authentication. And if that um, if the user can be authenticated, then a link is being sent back to Work Adventure, which is then being included as iframe. Okay. So, are there any more questions? Yes. Okay, so um, we, uh, Schmalkalden University is a, of Applied Sciences is a pretty small university, so um, usually we um, have a maximum of about 50 users. And um, so um, for us, um, the system works um, really fast, but um, of course, if you have larger numbers of users, then the system will eventually become slower. Yeah, so if there are no more questions, then I would like to thank you for your attendance and interest in the talk. And if you have any more questions which you l would like to ask me, just um, ask me now so, or someone after the presentation. I'm here for s still a couple of hours, um, uh, so just ask me and I will give my best to answer your questions. Thank you. <laughs>